Good morning, my friends, and welcome to this time of worship. As we gather together, we're not gathering for just some vague, abstract notion of worship, but we are called here with a mission and a purpose. We are here to by God, by multiplying frontier disciple makers through Bible, prayer, and outward community. We are here for a work, but a work of joy and honor. And my friends, I hope that you see and understand more and more the glories of our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we do this mission-filled worship together. But as we are a called people, we are called with these words from Psalm 140. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life, as long as I live. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jesus. Hope is in the Lord, his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives set prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. But the Lord out to those who are bound down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all Jews. My friend, the Lord himself greets us with these words from Second Peter. He says, may grace and peace be yours in abundance. And in our Lord, with this sense of greeting, why don't we turn to those around us and welcome them as well.
as part of our weekly worship, we confess our sins to the Lord because we acknowledge that we are in need of this Savior and find in Him the hope that our hearts are longing for. And so out of hope, let us offer these prayers to the Lord now. When at times you, Lord, please forgive us. We are high and we are nowhere to be found. Lord, please forgive us. When we wash our hands of responsibility, Lord, please forgive us. When we cast our lot with powerfuls and seek to buy freedom with silver, Lord, please forgive us. When fear keeps us from wit or truth, or our love of autonomy keeps us from believing, Lord, please forgive us. In the light of your presence, O oh God, our sin is exposed, and your grace is revealed. Realize the personal prayers of the Lord now in silence. Tender God, raise us in your love so joy we may witness to your awesome deeds. In the name of Jesus, the risen one.
assurance for us. We hear these words of assurance offered to us in Ephesians chapter 2, which says, You are no, no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God think of, about this calling to be God's temple here on earth. Let us sing of our commitment by standing together in body or in spirit and singing spirit. This morning's offering is for the general fund, shall we pray? Dear Lord, thank you to worship you. Thank you for everything you've given us. And as we give a portion of that back, may you bless it, may it further your kingdom. In your name, amen.
Thank you, deacons, for your talking a fair bit about you, you guys in a little bit. Not specifically you guys, deacons as a whole. But we are appreciative for your being in this congregation. As we think about some of the business of this church, uh, one of the great traditions of this church is that on holiday weekends, we do a potluck after the morning service. And uh, we remember whether you're a visitor, please come hang out with us. This, this kind of fellowship is a crucial part of, of how we grow closer together as the family of Hortons, the family of Christ in our service. That's a lived opportunity after the service. And uh, also what we do on these days is that instead of having our evening service, a meditation after the potluck, so it's going to be more of an afternoon service, that we, we pray that you would stick around for and be blessed by as well. Things that this church does, uh, we are gearing up to our GEMS and Cadets programs. That's going to be our Boys and Girls Clubs. You know, kind of think of it like Boys Scouts and Girl Scouts, but do that we are serving the children of this church and community is that we are asking for people to help serve as laborers with our kids. We would love to have each year uh, an, an adult, whether it be an adult who is a high school student or some grandkids of your own, but we're looking for older people that would partner with one of our students for a year. And the nice thing is we're trying to do this in a way that many hands makes light work. Uh, we're, if you're going to be a mentor for a while, we're making this simple and as fun as possible because we're not asking you to plan lessons or do anything when you come. In fact, if you come and you're not exactly sure what you're doing, a little bit of the fun because we want you to walk alongside of that student exploring this project. Maybe it's a new thing. Maybe you've done, never done this one before. But that new experience with that kid on together. So as you can explore new projects, as you explore Bible passages with them, uh, we're asking for you to be we're just coming to spend time with the kids because our one of our great big discipleship dreams for this church is as kids grow up in this church, that they will many older people in this church that they see as friends so that by the time that you're ready to go off to, to college or go off into some other type of work, that you have a group and a team around you that knows you, that loves you, and will continue to be a support for you throughout by just hanging out with the kid one-on-one -on -one as we do our group projects. Uh, it's a simple and easy way to build those types of relationships. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not as much of the personal person Maybe you're that programmer. Maybe you're like, no, I, I like planning. Well, there are ways that we can have you help with these ministries as well. Looking for people who can, can help come up with projects or maybe go out and get the materials, set things up. There's ways for people to help. And also at the same time, we're going to be starting up a members class. That's for those of you who want to know more about what a member of the church. You'd like to become a member of the church. Maybe you've been a member of the church, but you're still a little confused on who we are what we do. That's a class that we're going to be making available. Available, and I am excited to have that start in a little bit. But uh, and keep keep your ears out as we are getting ministries to come soon. Um, and as we think of of the family of this church and the way that we support each other through prayer, you know, one person we want being our in our minds is Joy SVV. Brother Gerald passed away yesterday, so we want to keep her in our thoughts and prayer. Uh, but with this prayer and others, let's turn to the Lord now together. Gracious Father, how great is our unending of the earth. You chose us to be saved through your sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. In love, you destined us to be your adopted children through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of your will and to the praise of His grace. So, Father, we ask that you would daily remind us of your unending mercies by caring for our continual needs. And we do thank you for your particular Deb VB and the many treatments that she has had to go through. We pray deeply that you good news as she follows us in the future. Give strength and healing to those who are in times of recovery. We think particularly of Tom T. and Dennis VB. Relieve Sadie V. Grateful that she is otherwise healthy. Give comfort to Joyce V. For the passing of her brother Jim. And 
We do lean upon the hope that comes from your resurrection, and we are grateful that he knows you and loves you. And as a child of you, experiencing all the benefits and when we are so happy for where he is, to realize that this does give pain and grief to remain. We pray for Joyce and the rest of the family. Offer up our prayers on behalf of the hardships of this world, but big things that are pressing on our minds as well. When we think of those who have been affected by the, the recent hurricanes and the storms and the flooding and the many homes, Father, give peace and recovery to those who've been in the way of harm. We think, too, of the Christians in Athens systematically killed by the Taliban. We think of even those who are not Christians. We think of all people in that turmoil and a, and a rapid change power. Father, you know, there are many other nations that are reasons for grief. But you know them all. And you have the power to work by your grace in all situations. Prove it to us day and day again. Not because you are failing in those places, but because we fail to remember them. Father, let your light shine in us that there is no opportunity to forget it. You are lovely and powerful and good. Lord, we offer this in the name of Christ. Amen. And now, my friends, I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Acts. As this morning, we are looking together at Acts 1 through 7. And what we've been doing as our church, we got a little bit of a break of it from when we were we're on vacation, but we're coming back to our series that we call Beginner's Guide. So in these first few chapters, we are looking at the beginners of Christ's church, and the way, the way they began continues to guide the way we do church today. And what specifically in this passage is the beginning of a new role for the family, role that we refer to as the deacons. We're going to see a little bit of, of why they were created and how the origin of this role continues to serve the today. But as we look at this passage in the description between the role and the mission of the elders as opposed to the role and the mission of the deacons, we're looking at the, just the broad theme of, of what we are supposed to do as we continue in these functions today. So there's going to be a little bit shop talk, a fair bit of shop talk in terms of what it means to be the church today. But we're ultimately going to see how it's all, all of us in the church today. But as we do this, we, uh, let's offer a prayer because we want his truth and wisdom to be what's spoken to The church is not really an institution, but it's a family. It is a way that we relate to one another on a daily and a weekly basis. But despite being a family, we take care of. And you have all this through the business of the church as well. You've given us a purpose, a structure, a method by which we can do that. When we follow your mission well, is when we see Father, make us this kind of family. Let us do the business well. So that those who are on the outside of a family, those who feel as orphans or widows would have a home here in your people, let us be these people. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Body or spirit as we honor God's word. Looking together at Acts chapter starting with verse 1. In those days, when, when 
number of the disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained again for being So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. Give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, also Philip, Prothorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed hands on them. So, the word of God spread. The number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. The number of priests became obedient to the faith. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The goals that we have had going through these chapters of Acts is to compare the mission of the early church and see how of this work that started many, many generations before. But as we try to apply that mission in their historical and cultural context, it looks like in our time in history and in our culture, uh, we should be familiar with a certain concept that maybe you've heard about it in other situations. It's a creed. And I've heard this applied in different Places. I've actually heard some people talking about this in terms of our involvement with Afghanistan. We're not going to be talking about it. I mean, in, in something that's more of a tame, easy to approach situation. Uh, who, who remembers the, the store, the business Sears? Famous for the Sears catalog. Uh, they, they are a prime example of what can happen as a result of mission. Mission creep is this idea that, um, you know, we had an original mission go goes well, we get bored to creep into other things. And over time, those other things can become a distraction. They lead away from what our primary mission was. And let's think about this. It was successful for many years. It started back in the mid-1880s by a man by the name of Richard Sears. And he had this innovative business idea because Durham lived away from the cities. People couldn't go to these department stores. And if you wanted to buy products, what were you going to do? You know, it might have been hours for you to get to the What if instead of having people come to the stores, we'll bring the stores to people? I'm going to start creating catalogs. So I don't have to create my own merchandise. All I have to do is send, and then they can shop from the convenience of their own home, and then we will ship and mail the products to them, and they don't have to leave their own places. And this was incredibly successful. People who lived, the people who lived in big, big cities were able to do. And this business boomed. It was groundbreaking in the way that they approached things. And drove they started to get bored with their business. It was just the same thing over and over again. So I thought, well, we got all this money because we were so successful in our mission. Let's do something, something different. So something that was meant to be an alternative to department stores ended up turning into these great big department stores. And then they started getting involved in photography businesses, creating skyscrapers as someone who comes from Chicago, I'm very familiar with the Sears Tower, and I said, you know what, let's get in the business of trying to make the biggest, why don't we start to get involved in the internet, let's become an internet provider, and so, who, who remembers Prodigy? Yeah, not a lot of hands on, on that one, you see, as they started getting involved in more and more things, like, your catalog, why, why are you building skyscrapers, why are you over the place? 
And as they started doing more and more things that were not on their mission, they started hurting more and more. And what eventually became the nail in the coffin of a company that was supposed to specialize in letting people shop from the comfort of their own homes and having products mailed to them, what and for this company that came around and let people shop from the comfort of their own homes while things were mailed to them. And that other company was the name of Amazon. Who's Amazon? So they were wiped off the map because of a company that did the thing that they were supposed to be doing of mission creep. They lost their original purpose and what they were for. Now why do I talk about this in church? From the pulpit, Acts chapter 6. To you business principles, to realize there is a business side to church. It is even our own family side, the nuts and the bolts that need to be taken. And we see that in this passage, God is creating an orderly way by which the primary mission of the church is meant to be done and accomplished. But over time, like every group of people, there is a temptation for mission creep to get distracted by things that that makes make life more complicated when the simple enjoyable. So we're going to be considering well, what did the early church look like, and have we have we missed our original mission and calling for how family of faith. So we go to the passage because this is where we want our teaching to come from. And we look at chapter 6, verse 1. It says, in those days when the numbers of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them of food. And so we see there is a problem that is growing in the church. This family is getting very big. There are thousands of people who are in this family and there are disciples of Jesus who are meant to oversee these thousands of people. And the bigger it gets, the more complicated this family is becoming. And one of the consequences of this large family and there is a distinction between the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews. And, and okay, well, What is that? And what's the difference between the two of them? Well, let's start thinking about the, the Hebrew, are the Jews of the followers of Yahweh, of God, who grew up in Israel. These are the people who have lived in probably the same areas their entire lives. And so for the Hebraic Jews, they share a culture, but these are also the people that, the, the people who've lived around you, been your best friends your whole life. You have a strong natural support in your extended family, whether it be these close friends that you have had for years. Hebraic Jews that when tragedy would come into their lives that occasionally be widowed out of the way to care for them because of this natural support network. The church was already caring to tell them to do it. They just did it. Because if you, you know, an aunt or a, you know, a sister or a friend or someone who's, does somebody have to come and tell you, love them, care for them? No, you just do it. It just happens. It's natural when you are deeply ingrained in a part of the family. These are people who also believe in Yahweh, the one true God. These are people who also grew up with a Jewish culture, but they didn't grow up in Israel. They grew up in the Roman Empire. And so what we see historically is that you would get these Jewish families for various reasons were living. But it, when tragedy came and struck them, where there was a woman who was unfortunately widowed because she didn't share much with the culture and the people around her. I don't know them dearly. 
they're people of blood, the people who share my culture. And so I'll be better cared for in Israel than in the places that I grew up. There's a very noticeable difference between those who've always lived in Israel and those who later came and joined Israel in order to have their needs taken care of. We see that, that those who come and join in the families, those who have always been there. One of the things that comes to my mind as I think about this difference is uh, there was a funeral that I did in my, in my previous church back in Indiana of a woman who was friend and, and after the service she said uh, she's going to miss her friend because they were best friends for 92 years. They always lived in the same town. You know, so as long as they can remember, as soon as they started preschool together, they were besties. And that never stopped. They always lived within a few blocks of each other. As someone who has moved around often in my life, that there's really no realistic way that I could possibly ever have a best friend for 92 years. I think particularly of a church like this, full of loving people. I am grateful that this church loves the people of this church, whether you have always lived in this church, you have joined the church, or whether you're a very visitor of this church. This church loves people, and it wants to love you. Yet there is a practical difference, isn't there? Of someone that may have grown up in this church, maybe you're related to half of this church by blood, you know, cousins, aunts, and uncles. These are people that you don't need to go out of your way to talk to and get to know because you're running into them throughout the weeks. We want to see more of that. That's a huge blessing. Maybe you're someone who's grown up in this church, and maybe you're not related to people by blood, but you might as well be because you are so tightly knit with the people. Awesome. What about people who come and join a congregation like this? Who haven't grown up in this church and don't know people as well, that your daily life is not constant of the people in this congregation. I can think again back to my previous church where there were people that maybe they married into the church. Or I can think of one particular family that they had been members of for almost 40 years, and yet they were still telling me that people would joke about them as being the outsiders. Not that they weren't loved, but notice that there's not quite exactly the same. And so this is what we see that is going on between the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews. Not that they do things. The Hellenistic Jews tended to be overlooked. Not intentionally slighted, but they were And in the case of the widows, widows in those days, this was not simply just a matter of you know, your church family being friendly. This was because widows in those days did not have a steady basic income. They, did, they often lacked daily food that would be able to sustain them. And so, through the crack, you know, they're kind of on the outside of the family. It can become a matter of life and death, and it was so in their situation. So what do you do? How do you fix it? gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. And so the apostles were saying, it's like, they the ones who are going to be taking care of all of these widows and their daily needs, uh, we're not going to have enough time to study and apply the Word of God to be able to teach others. And so we're looking for seeing a problem like this appear before back in Exodus chapter 18, when you had Moses leading an entire nation of Israel through the wilderness, and they're in the desert, and to help 
help them when they were in trouble was Moses. He alone was a person who was responsible for an entire nation. And I like to tell people, like, if, if you've ever been on a car trip and you've been like, you know, are we there yet? You know, I'm getting tired. Could you imagine if you had an entire nation that is behind you saying, when are we going to get there, Moses? This was not an easy job for him. And so when Moses' father-in-law, and stretched thin Moses was becoming, he said, this is not the way that you do business. This is not the way to get things done. And so he encouraged him to call what we now refer to as the Exodus chapter. Who are trained in the knowledge and the wisdom of God, those who are filled with the Spirit of God, and you share the work with them. They people are bringing to them, so you can focus on the most urgent of, of needs. You know, studying God's Word and trying to teach it and apply it to all the people. And so we see this, this you know, t- it's kind of, kind of, kind of playing zones in, in different sports of like, you know, you don't want everyone trying do the most important job or else the team's going to fall apart. The team is better off when we're focusing on their roles, playing zones, and so this is what they were doing back then. And now we see how the apostles are in addition of this work of the elder. Because Jesus is no longer here on, on earth. You can't go ask Jesus a question if you want to ask him a question. If you're sick and you need someone to pray over, you can't go to you go to the apostles the men who are called and equipped by the Word of God and the, the Holy Spirit to serve on his behalf. Now we have this similar problem. The, the, the apostles are trying to do their elder job, but now there's, there's other starting to rise up, and that's that the widows who, who didn't grow up in, in that area are starting to get hungry. They're starting to get overlooked. And so we said, so the people who can specialize on caring for these imply that feeding widows is an unimportant, very important task. Making sure that people are not going hungry, that is a very important task. And it is so important that we see the structure of the church reshaped around this need of those who were going hungry. So we know that this is an important task in the church. But we see that there's a distinction between the role of the elders and the role of the deacons. Not because the deacons are a small role in the church. Not because widows are unimportant in the church. They are incredibly important. The application of that is just that much more important. Because it is by the word of God that we be the kind of people who are a loving and caring and a You know, if we, if, if we would remove the word of God just to take, take care of the daily needs of one another, then the whole family of Christ would fall apart. So we're looking at two very important things. about someone who is gifted in the study of God's because God's word is so vital to who we are as a family. Don't let that put it up by other important jobs. Simply just call and equip other people who can do important And so this is what we see is, is happening. In verse 3, there's a focus on that ministry of spirit and wisdom. We could look at in the New Testament to see the qualifications of elders and deacons in the church that are a bit more thorough. But in here we see a very short list. A to the point. What are deacons? And notice that it doesn't say for our deacons we need them to be men who are really good at counting money. Doesn't say that. 
doesn't say that. Notice it also doesn't say, I want you to call the men who have really good donkeys so they can deliver food. This is the qualification of the deacons of the church either. What are the qualifications, the most important qualifications, that they are to be men who are full of the Holy Spirit? And this helps to highlight for us that deacons are not the ones who take care of the physical. Sometimes I, I hear people talk about, well, the elders care for the heart, but the deacons care for the stomachs of the church and make far too small the role of the deacons in the church. Because if it was simply just putting food into a hungry stomach, why do they need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and with wisdom? It doesn't help them. And so what we see is that the task and the responsibility of deacons is also a vital form of leadership in the church. Okay, what is this spiritual kind of care when the problem is that people are going hungry? Well, is the problem in this passage actually a lack of bread? Or is it a lack of family? Simply a lack of family. The people were not deeply ingrained into the family of the church. And so deacons are the ones who were to intentionally reach out to those who did not naturally be cared by the every member of the church. With the goal that with the care also in, so that they would become so deeply and naturally part of the church, she no longer had to intentionally care for them with the other members of the congregation. So there is a physical component, where if there's a financial need, if there is a need of food or other things like that, that, that is a part of it. But ultimately, these are the ones who are making family, who are deeply part of a family of faith. You need men and leaders who are full of faith. But it was distributing comfort and care, and encouragement to those who were in need. And in this passage, it focuses on the widows because they were the ones who were most likely to suffer when they were not part of a family structure. But we can apply it on the fringes. You know, maybe it's, it's going to be someone who's a part of this church or another church who is a single person who just doesn't seem to have the kind of family that other people have. You know, in those days, you know, foreigners, there were other people that, that needed love. And deacons are those who are called to be intentional where the natural love and care was not it being. We see that, that the deacons, they were called to make, make people family, to encourage, to care, to love, to draw them in. That's the work that the deacons I also said, well, let's think about What's the role of the elders? We see a little. We see this. This is the, the apostles who are elders. They said, "We will. We will turn this responsibility over to them. Prayer and the ministry of the word." So there are two goals, two missions that are given to the elders of the church. We already talked a little. Yeah, this is the foundational knowledge by which we all become active and effective members. If we do not have the word of God being taught, then we're not a church. We're just a social club. Role. But there's a second part that is given to the elders of the church. There's a ministry of prayer. There's two different things. Now, there might be a temptation. Okay, so what, what we're trying to say is that the deacons deal with the people, and the elders are supposed to kind of go into their rooms, close the doors, read the Bibles, and pray, and not talk to them. We see that this, this ministry of prayer and ministry of the Word are active and involved in
in being with the, the needs of the people. But it looks a little bit different. Because the deacons, they're taking care of the routine care, the, the daily needs of those who feel on the outside. But for the elders, the role of the elders that was established back in Exodus chapter 8, it's good to go back to the beginning source. What did the elders do back in Exodus chapter 18? Well, they were also referred to as judges over the people. Judge, what does that mean? Well, essentially what it was is people were dealing with problems or opportunities. And say like maybe it's like, <clears throat> I've, I've got to do. Or maybe it's that I've got this business opportunity and I don't know, it, would it be good? Should, should I do this over here? If you've got some sort of a crisis or dilemma in your life, but it'll be a problem, you don't know what to do, you go to your elder and say, what does the Bible say about this? And so they taught, but they taught to taking for care of the common needs of the church. The elders were to take care of the uncommon needs of the church, as well as teaching the Bible uh, abroad, you know, in gatherings together. We also see this with prayer. prayer the elders were to, to lead prayer in in the worship gatherings, but also when it came to specific needs and the, and the types of crisis that, that people would experience. In, involved and active with the people, not just in somebody's room or office, is James chapter 5, 14. It says, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint of the Lord. And so what we see is that there is a lot of overlap between what elders and deacons are meant to do. But it's also a game where we play zones. We serve in different capacities. So I, I picture the difference in my mind is thinking about the kind of maintenance that we do on our vehicles. Because you can go to different types of mechanics that specialize in different... different. For example, you got people who specialize in changing your oil, and because that's pretty much all they do, you can get in there and out of there like, like that. It's real nice and easy, and those about 50 still do that around here or not, but, they, but then I also think, think of, you know, if you get your, your tires, they need to be cared for. You know, I had a slow leak in my they do. They focus on just the, the normal basic daily needs of your vehicle. But what happens if your car doesn't you get ready to go to work, you, you turn the key and it, it doesn't work, it makes some sort of weird sound or no sound at all. Are you going to take it to an oil change place or a place that specializes in tires and brakes? That's not what they do. And so you would take your car to the people who know cars the best. These are the mechanics who know the vehicles, the, the manuals. They know their manuals so well that not only can they diagnose the problem, but they can help create the solutions that you need to create a healthy vehicle again. And so, so this is what we see between the Dominicans are the ones who take care of the routine, the daily needs of, of the church, whether it be distribution of food and funds or in, in, encouragement in just the simple prayers. It comes to the big, the, the scary, the urgent confusing matters of the church. This is where we want to have those who know manual so well we need to say, well, let's see what the Bible has to say and how it sheds light on the situation that we're dealing with right now. And so in the church, it's actually a very simple but efficient structure on how we are going to care for each other the way that Christ cares for us matters because every single one of us plays a role in the system of the church business. Because we see that there in which every church, remember, the Hebraic Jews, they were being cared for. When there was a widow among the Hebraic Jews, the apostles did not have their studying and teaching of the word of God because everyone who was a part 
part of that family structure was loving them, giving them the food, the encouragement, the prayers that they need. So we see that this is the backbone of the church. Every single one of us has a role to play in the care of God's family. And we want to make them fit naturally into this church family. Well, that's where the deacons come in. They're the ones who are to be a family. That they can experience the benefits of that every one layer of what this church is. So that's what the, the, the deacons do. But then we get the elders. The elders. They're going to play that role of teaching the word of God that we do throughout all of our gatherings so that we all know Jesus Christ better, that we would all become more like him because as, then we will naturally care for each other. That primarily, that foundational level happens by the teaching of God's word. But then also, these elders are going to be the ones who are going to help in those very common situations of the church. You might ask, okay, where are the pastors? I don't see the pastors on there. When we go back at school, we see that the name pastor as an elder or the teacher of the church. It's just another term for an elder, an overseer, a teacher of, of the church. Uh, so that's where I'm one of the elders of this congregation. But what we see here in, in the ways that there's a difference between the role of the elders and the deacons. The deacons are not junior elders. We have a temptation to think that, all right, if you are a man in this church, then you're qualified to be a deacon. But when you get a little older and you've got grandchildren, that's when you're qualified to be an elder. Is that how it's laid out? We see is that there are specific gifts specific calling, and both of them are incredibly church in the ministry of Jesus Christ. You don't want to put a square peg into a round hole just because time in their schedule and, and have kids or grandkids. That's not what these standards are based on. And I want us to be clear that the role of deacons is not a small one. In fact, all on some level to serve as deacons, because that word deacon in Greek is simply just deaconoia. It's just we are all called to be servants in this church. Men and women, we are all called to be servants in this church, but we see that there are particular men who are called to be the leaders of the service. They are called to be the leaders of the deaconoia. And that term servants, we think of it as small. We think of it almost as a shameful role. What does, the, what does that name and that role of deacon mean on the lips of Jesus? On the night that Jesus Christ was betrayed, before he was betrayed and hung on the cross, he washed his disciples, and as he did so, he called himself. A deacon oil. He called himself a servant. When we think of the what is the picture of what a deacon is meant to look like, we look at Jesus Christ, who himself referred to leadership as being a servant. Jesus gave. He led as a servant. He humbled himself before others. And that is what made him to be such a great leader. There's books that talk about be a humble leader. Well, yes, please do that. That's good. But it's far greater and bigger than being a man that Jesus Christ served as a deacon. What were we saying? as the primary mission of the deacons of the church. 
and to bring them into the family so much that they would experience all the benefits of being a member of the kingdom of God. That was the role taken for us. Well, let's just think of who we are by nature. Every single one of us, you and the pews, every single one of us has been born into sin, rebellious against God, cast out from the kingdom of heaven. That's who we, we are for in the mercy of God. That's who we are by birth. And yet what has Jesus done? He has taken us in the foolishness and the brokenness of our sins. And by his death on the cross, he would be set free from the chains that hold us in misery and in death. And by his blood, he brought us into that family of grace. We, who by our sins were spiritual widows, are now bride of Christ. We are the ones who receive all the benefits of the glory of God, of the kingdom that will never No more tears, no more pain or sickness or sadness. All of that becomes afforded to because Jesus led as a deacon and brought us into the family of faith by his sacrifice and by his ministry. So my friends, when we think of the business of the church, it is simply just a nuts and bolts of how do we make sure that the coins are being counted right and being moved in the right direction. What we are talking about is the kingdom of God and welcoming as many people into the fold of heaven that the kingdom of God would grow and the joys of his mercy would be ceases. It is not simply just bread on the table. It is the offer of the fullness, fellowship, of the family, the faith. And so, deacons play their role, elders play their role, every one of us plays a role in the work of this church. We need to make sure that we do not lose this mission. They are all in this family, but we are primarily a family. And what are we doing to love each other and care for each other well? For the years, we tend to get mission. And when we melded the church with Roman society and their structural system, we got about that. We got bored with what Jesus called us to do. And we start trying to add all sorts of ministries. And but friends, at its core, we are a family. And when we understand this mission, and when we do the efficient, simple mission that we've been called to, we see effectiveness. So the word of God, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of became obedient to the faith. So that the kingdom would grow and that all our needs would be satisfied in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, this church. We thank you for this church in the universal sense church, the church, the brothers and sisters around this world, we also think we do see your love. We're grateful to be in this place and a part of this family. That some parts of being in this family comes naturally. We don't have to think about it. But in the ways that are natural, make us intentional. Give us qualified 
sanctified men filled with the Holy Spirit that they would lead us and show us that we'd all become spirit-filled people of wisdom. Father, at times we are at a loss by your grace. Make us all find uh, make us to be people who all find our home in your church. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we think about the importance of that Holy Spirit that causes us to be a people who dwell together, please let us stand now in body or in spirit and sing together. Dwell in me, O blessed Spirit. Friends, when we live there, what's some practical application? How can I, I do this passage? Fantastic opportunity to be the fact over in this fellowship hall. We encourage you, please, whether you're a member, visitor, whatever, stick around. Join us as we fellowship with one another, being a family of faith over here after the service. I you to stick around a little bit longer as we do a, a patient studying God's word a little more. Uh, but brothers and sisters, as we sing from Numbers chapter 6, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. be gracious to you and turn, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Brothers and sisters, let us go now together in this mission and in this peace.